about getting into the Word of God with you. Uh, so if you would, turn in your Bibles or go on your apps to Romans chapter 12. Title of our study today, A Righteous Response. The first 11 chapters of Romans focused on our need for and God's provision of a savior, one who would pay for our sins so he could rightfully forgive all our sins, making it possible for us to be born again and adopted in and, and children of the living God. So having explored in those first 11 chapters, God's grace and his mercy and his righteousness, his justice, his faithfulness, Paul exhorts all who are in Christ Jesus to a rational, reasonable, and righteous response. So, a couple of things in the way of introduction. Those first, um, well, let's see, for first few chapters were all about man's need for a Savior and God's provision of the Savior. When we got chapters 6, 7, and 8, it was all about the freedom we have in Christ Jesus, free from sin and death, free from the law, free from condemnation. And then 9, 10, and 11, we see the faithfulness of God to Israel, who was unfaithful to him. And we learn when we're faithless, he's faithful. When we falter, he never does. So that makes us secure in him because his promises to them hey, they're going to all be yes and amen in Christ Jesus. They, like us, have to come through Jesus. But we saw his heart is still for them. His eyes are still on them. He still has a plan for them. Well, we begin here then in, in uh, Romans 12.1. Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There in verse one, he says, I, I beseech you, I plead with you, I beg you. He's not commanding this. He's, he's pleading with us in light of and in response to God's great mercy toward us, to offer ourselves, to present these bodies a living sacrifice. He says it's holy, acceptable, reasonable, rational. Some say, uh, which is your reasonable worship. Here, your reasonable service. Both are true. And, and then in verse 2, we read it. And do not be conformed. It's literally stop being conformed to this world. What's the difference? Well, the implication is clear. That's how it reads in the Greek. That it's natural and normal for us to want to fit into the world around us. To, to, to be a part of it. And of course, no one wants to be an outcast. But as the world gets weirder and more hostile to the gospel and more hostile to holiness and purity and everything that God has for us, well, he's saying we cannot let ourselves be conformed to all of that, but need to be being transformed. How does he do that? By the renewing of our minds. To what end? That we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You must be aware, unless you're brand new, Israel's priest offered sacrifices morning and night every single day. And then on the, there were certain days, holy days, there were multiple sacrifices. There were great feasts and festivals where thousands of sacrifices would be offered. But the priest offered first for himself, for his sin, then he offered for the sins of the people. And no one ever came to the temple of God without an offering, without a sacrifice, because that sacrifice, that offering was saying, I know I'm guilty, I know I'm chosen, I know you love me, but I know you're holy and I can't approach you apart from sacrifice. Well, listen, 
things are a little different for us, and here's why. We are priests, kings and priests, he says, unto our God, Jesus, our holy high priest. Not only that, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he'll get into this and develop it as we get into the next book, uh, which is just you know, a little ways out. But 1 Corinthians, he'll talk about this temple that, that he's fashioned and formed without hands, of which we are living stones, a, a, an organic, growing, thriving temple unto our God. And we don't bring a sacrifice. We offer ourselves a living sacrifice. Having been crucified with Christ, Paul will later write, nevertheless, I live. And just as Jesus was a living sacrifice, he was alive, he sacrificed himself, and he rose again. Well, we're not dead sacrifices because we're no longer dead in trespasses and sin. Now, when I say we're, I'm including you in that, that group. Only you know if that's true for you. If not, today is the day of salvation. When we get to the end of all this, you want to give your life to the one who gave his life for you. So, scriptures tell us we are in the world, but no longer of the world. And verse 2 has been translated, stop letting the world squeeze you into its mold. You know, God was hands-on when he created Adam and Eve. And he's hands-on in recreating us. It's not something he does from a distance. No, it's something he is engaged in. In fact, he has taken up residence within every born-again believer in Christ Jesus and the person of the Holy Spirit. So he's saying, stop letting the world have its way. Stop giving your heart to the world. Stop letting the world squeeze you into its mold. I believe a worldly Christian should be an oxymoron, but many profess something they don't possess and actually pos profess someone they don't possess who doesn't possess them, and that would be Jesus. True believers, and this should be true for all of you, are transformers, transformed by God, transformers in the world, but those who call themselves believers but aren't, they're conformers. Their whole mindset leaves them confused and corrupted and compromised. So we're to be being transformed. That's the sense and the tense of that be transformed. It's, it's an ongoing be, being. And, and here's the other thing. That word transformed is the word metamorphosis. It was the word used of Jesus' transfiguration, where they were Peter, James, and John with him on, well, it's known now as the Mount of Transfiguration because of what they saw there, where Jesus began to let the glory within shine on them. They saw what we'll all see when we stand before him in glory. We will see him glorified as he prayed, Father, I want him to be with me and see the glory I had with you before the world began. So they saw something that was hidden by his humanity, and that was the glory that was within. We're a little different from Jesus in this way. Our humanity isn't hiding glory. It's hiding depravity. It's, it's hiding our degradation. In fact, I remember a pastor using the illustration, and I loved it. He said, how horrible would it be if we had a little monitor on our forehead and as we talk to people and we're like yeah everything's cool uh, what was actually going through our mind was going across the screen listen we'd all be wearing bangs or, or we'd have hats pulled down very far over our forehead why we wouldn't want people to know what we were actually thinking or what what was going on inside of us why because our humanity is hiding that we're worse than we appear to be. But Jesus' humanity was hiding, but only for a time, the glory and the goodness and the wonder of what it is for God to take on flesh. Pastor Dominic shared last night, 
John 1.14, that was his text. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. It was a glorious teaching. I encourage you to check it out. Dom was on staff with us for many years, many moons ago. And, uh, but anyway, he's been around and he's subbing for some of us at different times. And it's just neat to have him on board. He pastors a little church out in, oh, let me get this right. Who knows? I knew that. Just checking to see if you knew. Thank you very much. I needed that. Hamilton City. And so it's, it's a little church out there. But anyway, great teacher. He's on the app, by the way. You can get it and see what he did last night. So what does he say and where are we here? That uh, we're to be transformed, transfigured, if you will. That, that the world could see the light within us. Let your light so shine, our Lord says, that men would see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. The other thing, because Jesus lives in us, we're not just reflecting the light and the love of Christ. You know, the moon doesn't have its own light. It reflects the light of the sun. And there are a lot of people that are like that. They're, they're reflecting something in the culture or in their upbringing, some better than others as far as what they've learned and how they act and the, the choices they make. But we're not just reflecting Jesus. We're radiating him. Why? Because he lives within us in the person of the Holy Spirit. That means there's light coming forth from us and there's warmth because we're radiating him and that's a radiant, warming heat. So, um, how do we do this? He told us, by the renewing of our minds. Washed in the word, cleansed by the word, committed to God's will as revealed in his word. We saw, and it's the last thing, and then we'll move on into verse 3, that God's will for us isn't vague or general. It's specific, it's good, it's acceptable and perfect. Well, verse three says, I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. These two are gonna come up again and again in this letter and in this section. But, but note, it's grace, the, the grace given to us. And then, well, it's the faith that God has also provided. It'll come up here, but we were saved by grace through faith. That, not, not of ourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any should boast. But we don't stop there. We're not just saved by grace through faith. We're transformed by grace through faith. We serve by grace through faith. We're gifted by God's grace through faith. And we're going to see that as we continue on this week and next week and for the next few weeks in this section that focuses on our relationships primarily. Up to this point, it's been things to learn. And now it's how to live, having learned those things. And the, the three relationships that he focuses on in chapter 12 is first our relationship to God should make perfect sense to all of us because the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. The more I get to know him, the better I love him. The, the greater uh, I'm grateful to him. And then it goes to our relationships with one another in our natural families and our supernatural families, our physical family and our spiritual family. And then finally, he'll deal with our relationship to our enemies. And he deals with those three, starting here, of course, because of what God's done. He's saying, hey, give yourself wholeheartedly to him. Present yourself a living sacrifice once and for all. And then don't let the world have its way in you but be transformed by the renewing of your minds that you could prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So having uh, read this through the grace given to me that I'm not to think, you know, more highly of myself than I am, nor are you, but to think soberly 
as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. He is telling us, and he will develop this. When we get into the next letter, his letter to the first letter to the Corinthian church, he'll focus in chapters 12, 13, and 14 on the many ways God's gifted us and how he's made us a part of something greater than ourselves, the body of Christ. And he introduces that concept here, and he says, listen, there's just one body in Christ. And we are all members of that body, parts of that body. I have one body. It has many parts. They all have a specific function. There are things my feet just don't do well. I'm not that limber. I've never thought I should try to feed myself with them. But I, I know there are weirdos on the planet who do that. And, uh, but, but I have hands, and, and they work real well in getting food to my mouth. Sometimes Pam's like, use a fork mainly to the grandsons, but sometimes me too. But, you know, the, the point is my hands do th certain things, my feet do others. I can't run on my hands. I can't even run on my feet, but you get the point. You can do that. So all of that to say we're different parts. Every part's essential. I'm going to come back to that. Every part's important. That means you in the body of Christ are absolutely essential. And you need to know it. You need to believe it. And then you need to act as if you believed it to be true. So he says, we shouldn't think too much of ourselves, but to think soberly. Why? God's given us faith. And we have many members in the body. They don't all have the same function. Being many are one body, individually members of one another. That means we should have an attitude as we deal with one another of true humility. Now, humility isn't diminishing yourself, but it certainly isn't exalting yourself either. It's not diminishing your part in the body or exalting your part. It's not diminishing your gifts given you to do the ministry God's called you to, nor is it exalting those things. To, to be dealing in humility is to have an honest assessment of your potential without Christ and now your potential in Christ. Paul gives it to us in just a couple words. He says, without Christ, I can do nothing. Then later he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So apart from him, I'm useless. But in him, I'm useful and can, well, please him and bless people in his name. So I do want to say, and some of you feel the same way, I didn't appreciate our government deeming me non-essential. I mean, I would have been essential if I had a pot shop or a liquor store or a casino. All of those were essential. But church and pastors specifically, not really needed. It just tells you how little value our culture places and our leaders in this culture and in this state specifically place on what God's doing in us. Now, that's not necessarily their fault. If they don't know the truth, then they're walking in darkness. If they don't know Jesus, they're walking in deception. But that's still troubling. And I want to say, when God looks at me, and this is what truly matters, he sees my actual potential. He knows what he's created me to become, what he's fashioning and forming to be, and how he can use all that to bring glory to him and bless people for him in his name. So listen, the same thing is true for each and every one of you. He knows exactly what he's saved you for we know what he saved us from and let's be honest that was mostly what we were concerned about when we gave our lives to the lord we don't want to end up in hell and if heaven and hell are real and jesus affirms both well then we want to make sure when we die we get to heaven but 
God's concern isn't getting us to heaven. That's the easiest thing in the world for him. He forgives us our sin, says we're born again, uh, sealed into the fullness of his redemption. No, what he wants to do is, is use us between here and heaven. And even for God, that's trying. Why? We're not always compliant. We're not always, well, we, we read it and we say we believe it, but then we leave and act as if we don't. So we want to make sure that doesn't happen to us. Well, verse 6, he gets back into the, the, the grace and faith because he says, having gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Now, this is one of many lists of spiritual gifts. It's not, it's not going to list all the spiritual gifts, and we're not going to try to develop all the nuances of each. This is the big picture study on these things. When we get into 1 Corinthians, we'll get into much more detail because he'll break them into, you know, sign gifts and serving gifts and speaking gifts and all of that. But for now, he says, we don't all have the same gifts. We're not all the same part. So we don't need the same gifts because the gifts are given to complement the part of the body he's made us. But note this, it says we have these gifts according to the grace that's given to us. So if it's prophecy, then prophesy in proportion to what? Our faith. The one who foretells the word or forth tells the word comes saying, thus says the Lord. And, you know, not every pastor or every teacher says, thus says the Lord. Billy Graham was fond of saying, the Bible says. I love that because thus says the Lord. Do you know that most of the prophecy in Scripture isn't about the future, though there is such prophecy? It's mostly foretelling. And two kinds of prophets prophesied in, in the Old Testament dispensation. There were those who'd stood in the presence of God. They'd heard from the Lord. And when they came saying, thus says the Lord, they were telling people exactly what God told them to say. There were other prophets. They said the same thing. Thus says the Lord. But God says of them, they never stood in my presence. They never heard from me because if they had, they would have turned my people from their sin. And that was a great deal of what prophecy was in the Old Testament, was God's prophets coming saying, hey, you're messing it up here, and God wants you to get it right. So this is what you need to do. Again, there is that prophetic part where, like in Matthew 24, Jesus tells us things related to the end times. Mark 13, Luke 21, same basic message. Book of Revelation, much of that, Really, almost all of that is, is future. There are some things that are already reality. Did you know that there are already people at the throne of God casting their crowns at his feet, worshiping him, saying, holy, holy, holy? How do we know? Paul says later, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. Not unconscious, not sleeping, as some suggest. The body looks asleep, but the man, the woman, they're with the Lord worshiping him in glory, perfected by him. And so, so picture this right now. Our, our, our dads and moms and, and for some of us sons or brothers or sisters or daughters or, 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 you know, those who've gone before us but who died in Christ Jesus, they are at the throne of God, worshiping him, casting their crowns at his feet. And we even know what they're singing. We can practice it so when we get there, because the moment we breathe our last here, we will be joining them. And so, so important to get this, that, that this picture is, well, there's stuff that we need to hear. So right now, what I'm attempting to do is just to share the word of God with you. My prayer is that I'd be able to speak clearly, that I'd be able to speak sincerely, that I'd be able to, to add insight where, where there's background that you might not know or where there are intricacies in the words themselves that not everybody's aware of. That's where I come in. But if you just read the word, 
you get everything you really needed. You, you might not learn as much, but it would all be alive. His word's alive and powerful. Guess what? My words, not always. Not so much unless he's giving them to me and I'm speaking forth for him. And again, that's always my prayer as well. So gifts differing. I talk about prophecy because those who declare the word of God and preach the gospel are doing just that. Ministry, verse 7, he says, let us use it in our ministering. Ministry is just serving. In fact, this is the most commonly needed gift and one that, well, a lot of people don't really consider themselves called to serve. But Jesus understanding his disciples and and you know they totally thought well you know the kingdom's going to come and he says we're going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of israel and their common argument was which of them would be greatest in the kingdom of god it's such a funny argument because the greatest is jesus that position was always taken and then they're like okay well second greatest hey i've run races when i could run And I've swam races when I could swim. And, well, I can still swim. But anyway, competed. I never was going for second place. Everybody wants to be first. But Jesus says that the greatest in the kingdom of God isn't the one with the most servants. It's the one who serves the most. The greatest in the kingdom of God is the servant of all. So I would say, as he said that day, you want to be great? Great. Be a servant. Yield yourself and say lord how do you want to use me what what could you do through me you know i'm not much and if you think otherwise you know i've got a lot to offer lord you could think either thing but still not serve you need to find a place you need to be a servant at home first because you're an example to your little flock then you need to be a servant in the fellowship if possible Because there's something all of you can do. And if we get the whole body thing, if any part of my body isn't working, I have a hard time. If you ever wake up and and your leg was asleep, you had to go to the bathroom real bad so you didn't notice your leg was asleep, and you get in there like, oh, my gosh, you know. And then Pam's like, what's wrong with you? And I go, oh, nothing, you know, just like you would. Listen, if any part isn't working, A cramp in the middle of the night, if you never had those, I pray you never do. I get really wonderful cramps where there's one in the front at the top of my foot and one in the back at my calf. So I was taught if you have a cramp here, do this. But if you do this, that cramps the other side. Anyway, all of that to say this. Not all of my parts are working as well as they once did, but they're all still working. And that enables me to stand before you and share the word of God with you, to love on you, pray for you. And I'm encouraging full participation. Why? We're a body. And if one part suffers, we all suffer. If one's exalted, we should all rejoice. Well, he's going to say more about all that as we continue on. So uh, if we have different gifts, if we're preachers, preach it, but do it in faith. And, and know it's a gift of grace. If, if you're a minister, even serving is a gift from God. It's not punishment that God would make us servants because Jesus is the servant of all. And he's the greatest in the kingdom of God. He who exhorts in exhortation. This is an important word because many people believe exhortation is like rebuking people, pointing the finger at them, letting them have it. Exhortation is encouraging people. And when I cross over from teaching to preaching, and believe it or not, that happens now and then. You can't tell because I'm not pounding and, you know, walking and my hair's not, you know, I don't have the... But anyway, the, the, the point is preaching is just teaching with a view toward persuasion. So when I move from telling you what it says to encouraging you to do it, to be obedient to it, that's preaching. That's a part of what he's talking about here, exhorting people to faith, to hope, to love, to repentance, to obedience, to confidence. 
He who gives with liberality, generously, cheerfully, not grudgingly or of necessity, and never to be seen of men. As Jesus pointed out, the religious leaders of his day were guilty of. They did their good work so men would see it. They gave so men would see it and think, wow, look at them. People should see our good works and say, wow, God's amazing. Using that guy, I know him. Using that gal, I know her. They should be seeing us in our works, but glorifying our Father in heaven. He who gives with liberality, then he who leads with diligence. Every parent is a leader. Every big brother or big sister physically or spiritually is a leader. We think of leaders as the few that everybody knows who they are and what they do. That's not how it is in the body of Christ. Every leader is a shepherd, and a good shepherd never drives his sheep. The good shepherd never beats the sheep. A good shepherd leads the sheep. That's why Jesus says, I, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. They won't follow another because they don't know the voice of strangers. So see yourself if you're raising a family or you have kids or grandkids or nieces or nephews or, or you know, siblings, all of which we raised in our home at one point or another, every living relative younger than me, and they were all younger because I was the oldest, they all, except my brother Tony, even Felicia, his twin, they all lived with us and off of us at one point. My brother's boast is I never did that. And I'm like, well, that's something, I guess. But, uh, you know, just means he's an outsider in the whole Allen clan. But th the point is this. Good shepherds lead the sheep. You know, they have cattle drives. You know where they call them that? They drive the sheep. I mean, they drive the cattle. Yeah, that wouldn't make any sense, would it? They drive the cattle. But Jesus doesn't drive his sheep. He, he, he leads us, and, and he leads us, you know, to green pastures and beside still waters, and he restores our soul and leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name sake. Well, anyway, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Do you know you can be merciful to someone and demean them at the same time? You can give to someone in need and make them feel worse about their situation than before you tried to help them. Because if you look down on them and you think they don't notice that, well, we can be grateful we're wearing masks a lot right now because, I mean, with the exception of our forehead, they, they can't see much of us. But I've looked in people's eyes and just seen condensation. Condensation? No, that's not the word. Yes. Oh, that means they were starting to tear up, right? Yes. But, but they were condescending in their attitude toward me. Not lately, by the way. It, not that it couldn't happen. Um, people in the world still have that. They look at me and think, you, you're so stupid. You think God's real? You think heaven's real? What an idiot. Well, they won't always think that. But I can't take any pleasure in knowing unless they come to Christ, they'll spend eternity dead in trespasses and sins, separated from him. There's no joy in knowing that. So, so what we have to do, if we're going to give or we're going to serve or we're going to share, or we're going to show mercy, we need to do it with cheerfulness, forgiving and forgetting because that's how God shows mercy to us. We help the poor and we give to, uh, you know, those in need because that's how Jesus has dealt with us. Well, the woman they brought to Jesus, who they say was caught in the very act of adultery, a troubling story on so many levels, at the end of the story, because we don't have time for it today, Jesus says, listen, neither do I condemn you. He didn't condemn her, though she was certainly guilty of sin, and the law said she could be stoned for what she'd done. He says, I don't condemn you. And some people grab that and say, see, I could do anything I want, and he won't condemn me. But he told her afterwards, go and sin no more. 
Now we want the whole story because to get half of it, if I only, if it's just go and sin no more, that could be license to sin. Man, it's, if, if it's neither do I condemn you, well, if I, I'm, excuse me, if I say neither do I condemn you, that, that could be license to sin. But when he says go and sin no more, that means, okay, you're forgiven, but I want you to go back to that sin. You know what they say, right? It's in the word. As the dog returns to his vomit, why would God use an illustration of, like that to say that's what it's like when he watches us go back to our sin? Have you watched a dog eat their vomit? I have a poodle. They won't do that. Even poodles are smarter than people because they do it. And God's saying, man, it's sickening to him. It's sickening to think of. Well, all our gifts, natural and spiritual, they come from him. They're given to bless others and to glorify him. So, so he begins to lay out seven things that, that we can focus on, and then we'll just have our, our conclusion when we get that far. But, but, but we're at a very important part of this. So, so uh, if you're starting to drift in, you're like, oh my gosh, these chairs are so comfortable. I forgot what it was like to be in here. And I know some of you are gonna learn a lot today and some of you will wake up refreshed. And I want to say, as long as you don't snore, God gives his loved ones rest. If this is the only place you have find peace and you feel at rest, you could actually shut your eyes and, and not be stressed. Hey, rest. Come, come to both services, though. Rest in one and then, then uh, or get the app even better. Because, you know, I'm really plugging that app today. Um, okay, so I, I do want to say, as we press into this next section, I can't say, and I don't say, I don't serve because I don't have the gift of ministry. I don't help the poor give the missions because I don't have the gift of giving. He lists those. There's ministry. There's, there's giving. And, and then, well, I, I don't, you know, forgive, forget, or show mercy because well, I don't have the gift of mercy. You know, I, I can point out people here, but I won't because it would embarrass them who have the gift of mercy and if something happens and you're hurting and you're around them, man, they are going to be so comforting to you. But I, I, I know there are people here who are actual evangelists. But so when they share the Lord, people always give their life to Jesus. But I don't get a pass on any of the gifts because that's not my primary ministry or my strongest gift or maybe not my gift at all. Paul tells Timothy who there's no evidence he was an evangelist. That, that he should preach the gospel. Why? Everybody needs to hear it. It doesn't matter if you're just planting the seed in someone else's water. Somebody's going to, you know, give the message that brings the harvest. But he says the one who plants is nothing anyway, nor is the one who waters. It's God who brings the harvest. So it's all about him. So um, a new commandment I give you, Jesus says at one point, that you love one another as I've loved you. And, and so this first exhortation of seven in our loving, verse nine, we're to let love be without hypocrisy. We're to abhor what's evil, cling to what's good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. Paul uses three of the four Greek words that are translated in Scripture, love, in this short section. The first of them is agape. We're familiar with it. It's unconditional, sacrificial love. It's the love that God showed when he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. How do we know it's that love? He said, for God so loved agape, the world, he gave his only begotten son. But there's, there's something else. That's John 3, 16, right? You know it. You flip that six around, it becomes a nine. And, and, and it says, men love darkness more than light. And it's the same Greek word. It's the strongest word for love. They are passionately committed to the darkness. They love the darkness the way God loves us. That's a scary thing to consider. So, let love be without hypocrisy, kindly affectionate, brotherly love. 
preferring one another, honoring one another. Well, there's something else. He says, don't let it be in hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is the opposite of being real with people, being authentic, being open and honest. And it gets harder and harder to be those things when you know you can tell someone the truth. You can speak it in love, and they can call you a bigot, or they can call you a racist, or they can call you something that's like so not what you are, and you're like, oh, my gosh, what are you talking about? We can't worry about how the world receives or doesn't receive the truth, but we have it. And if we're ashamed of the truth or we don't speak the truth or we don't do it in love, how will they ever hear it? And here's what I've learned. You tell somebody something true. This is what the Bible actually says. God will work in them and on them. He won't let them rest. You don't even have to pray. Don't let them rest until they deal with it, Lord. Because he loves them so much he sent his son to die for them. You think he won't use his word if you'll tell them what his word actually says? No, he will. And you can count on it. So agape, this is that love that is oh so important. It's the love God has for us. And it's the kind of love he wants us to show one another. He goes on to say, abhor what is evil, shrink from all that is lewd, malicious, wicked, and cling to what is good, cleave. So the, the next word is, or the next command has to do with family affection. It's philea storge. And then there's philea delphi. We get our Philadelphia from that. Family affection, well, that's the reciprocal tenderness of parents toward their children and children and siblings for one another. It's true in the natural family, and it's true in our supernatural family. Been all over the world. I meet Christians, and, and I instantly love them, and they love me back. And we don't know anything about each other. We certainly don't know what that person was before he or she was in Christ. But what we do know is we sense the love of God from them. We see it in their eyes. We hear it in their voice. We know it in their attitude toward us. And he's saying we need to have that kind of affection, natural and supernatural, in our spiritual family and our physical family. And here's why this is oh so important right now. Because the Bible tells us in the last days, men will be without natural affection. That's true of women too. It explains at least in part how there could be so many millions and millions of aborted babies. Natural affection would say, I would never do that. We would have never done that. We weren't even Christians. I, I can't, you know, it's beyond me. And listen, I'm not saying this to make you feel horrible if you went through that. And, and, and you know, people told you, oh, don't worry, it's just tissue. It's not alive, it's not a person. We know better now. Well, I always knew, but, but, but we know better now because we have such technology. You can see that baby sucking its thumb and you can see it making a fist and you're like, this guy's gonna be a fighter. And, but it's a person, it's alive. God breathes life into it. And, and he makes those babies a living soul. The lack of natural affection is disastrous to society. So all of that brings us to that, oh, that third one, brotherly love. That's love of the brethren, the spiritual family in Christ Jesus. And uh, in honor, giving preference, we read, to one another. So listen, if you put other people first, in this me first generation, that is going to turn heads. They're going to be scratching and saying, what in the world? Do you ever go to a big event and hear anybody saying, me last, me last? You know, people are pushing and shoving, and that's just it in and out, you know? But it's like no one wants to get last in line. You want to get up front and hope they'll start a new line. But, but my point is when you're like, no, you first, people are like, why? Why would you let me go first? That's an open door to explain how God has blessed you and cared for you and done so much in your life and you want them to have 
that experience. Verse 11 gets into our serving, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Diligent means not slothful in business. Uh, and, and we're to be good witnesses at work. Some people think they're called to be witnessing at work, but a good worker is more concerned with his witness than his witnessing. Because if you're a good witness, you'll have opportunity, not on the boss's dime, but at some point in time to share when they're asked, okay, how do you do it and why do you do it? You're, those people make fun of you and you're kind to them. They, they, they mock you and you, you, you're loving toward them. Why? That gives you that open door. So uh, the word fervent means on fire spiritually, serving the Lord, doing all things as unto him. And when you're done it unto the least of these, our Lord says, you've done it unto me. So loving in our serving in our trials and tribulation, verse 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. This is a picture of thriving, not just surviving, and especially in times like these. So remember this, nothing you endure, Jesus hasn't gone through first. So Paul, back in Romans 5, 3, some months ago, not only that, we glory in tribulations, knowing tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance, character, character, hope. James said God uses trials to mature us. Peter, to prove our faith genuine. Paul exhorts us then to be hopeful, to be patient, and to be prayerful. Not only in our loving and in our serving and in our trials and tribulations, but in our giving. And we saw earlier, God loves a cheerful giver. And we're to be generous, cheerful, and expectant. Not giving to get, as some are suggesting we should or could, but giving because we already have. If any of you don't have enough of what you need today, well, I'm not saying it's impossible, but I'd be surprised. There are millions of people who won't even get fresh water today or any good food today, but we're not them. And so he's saying we should be distributing verse 13 because I'm giving you the, 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 the picture and then he gives us the verse, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. It just means sharing our stuff and ourselves. Requires, first requires an open heart and open hands. The second, an open home. And I want to say in this day and age, this is oh so needed because it's far less common in our culture. But here's what I know from experience. Stoners hang out and drunks hang out and gamblers hang out. And I've only been guilty of two of those. But, um, and I'll, I'll leave you to wrestle with it. I've repented of all of them though, just in case. I'm not guilty recently, but not even in the last three and a half decades. But my point is this. People have fellowship that are living lives that are self-destructive. We have the most constructive lives possible. but We don't all enjoy the fellowship of the saints. So in any case, in our, in our giving and in our forgiving, that's the fifth. Bless those who bless you, curse those, and do not curse. They had heard it was said. He said, you've heard it as it said. Bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. That's not what the Bible teaches. And it's so important to get it that, that we're to bless those that wouldn't bless us, those who persecute us. Bless them and do not curse. Why? God forgives our sin and forgets our sin. He deals with this as if we'd never sinned. And by the way, cursing comes natural. That's why he doesn't say, just do what comes natural. He has to actually tell us to be forgiving, to be merciful, to be gracious, because those things don't come natural. They are supernatural responses to people who've wounded us and spoken evil of us. Only two more. In our empathizing, verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. You know, empathy enables us to do both. People are celebrating. You know what keeps us from doing those? 
envy and jealousy. So if I have empathy for that person, I'm happy to see them doing well. And, and I'm caring when they're hurting and down and wounded and, and afraid. Empathy moves us to rejoice with them and weep with them. But envy and jealousy makes it difficult to do either. In our thoughts and associations, that's the seventh, verse 16. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. All of this is the opposite of the worldly, carnal mindset that's oh so common in our generation. He says, be of the same mind. The only way we can agree today just about anything is to have the mind of Christ because we have opinions and preferences and most of them about things that aren't that important and yet we magnify it in the place where they divide us. That should never happen in Jesus' church. We should never be divided because we have different preferences or different opinions or we read different things. We should be united because we're in Christ Jesus and we're the body of Christ. The body set against itself is doomed to fail. So to be like-minded with Jesus is to be humble. My preferences, my opinions, they become less and less important as I fix my mind on Jesus. Finally, verses 17 uh, to 21, we close. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Key word there is if. I should never be burning bridges to people, no matter what they're trying to do. If they're trying to burn the bridge, I should be getting water and putting that fire out. I should never be the one responsible for breaking fellowship with someone or closing the door in their face. Why? Because we're, we're to live peaceably with them. We're witnesses to them. We're the light of the world, a city set on a hill. So listen, if I'm at peace within, that means I'm at peace with him. And if I'm at peace within and with him, I can be a peacemaker in the culture. And we need more of them because everybody's just going crazy. Beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath. Verse 19, for as it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. You know, when someone hurts us, we have two choices. We can hurt them back get even, or if you were anything like me before, you know, Christ, it's like, I'm not just getting even. I'm going to teach them a lesson so they'll never do that again. I could try to settle up, but God says, don't. Why? That's not what I'm called to. That, that's not my place today. I can let God deal with my enemies. And by the way, I've seen what he does. And, and what I have to guard my heart against is rejoicing when my enemies fall when my enemies are hurt, because, listen, we have them. But, but he's saying, don't avenge yourself. Give place to wrath. Let God take care of that part. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. You know, in the Old Testament, it was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and life for life. And it, that, by the way, was the foundation of our legal system here. But it was given to to, to judges and courts, not individuals. That's why Jesus says, forgive them and pray for them and do good to them. Even those who've hurt you and wounded you and offended you. Because our job isn't to judge them. There are judges for that. But, but we're not to be taking that uh, on us. We're neither to um, treat our enemies the way we would naturally, but as God does us. Loving, blessing, and the hope they'll repent and be forgiven. Finally, and therefore, it's his last therefore and my therefore too. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. Is this not the opposite of getting even? Your enemy's hungry, feed him. Thirsty, give him a drink. In doing so, you'll heap coals of fire on his head. I, I, I challenge the first service people to figure out what that last one means. <laughs> Because you know, I asked, how many of you know? And no one did. And I said, well, I don't know either. But I actually do know. 
in those days because, you know, fire wasn't something you could just, not everybody had been a Boy Scout, and they didn't know you could just get some sticks and do that, although I tried it, and it never worked. But, but the people carried around hot coals because that could get a fire going, and fire was an essential when you couldn't just, you know, use a clicker or start one with a match. Or, and so he's saying, feed your, your hungry enemies, give your, your drink, a, a drink to the thirsty, and, and, and you'll be providing something for them that'll warm them and be necessary for them. And don't become, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Listen, so important that we take these things to heart. I realize there's been a lot. I went a little bit long for that. I apologize, but I'm not that sorry. And uh, because th this is our hour in the word of God. My prayer is that you're getting that every day. You've got a devotional life and you're listening to good teaching on the radio or, or on, the, on your app or on our app. But, but uh, that's my last, you know, commercial for the app. But w we need to do good when others don't. Lord, thank you for your words of encouragement and hope and for the reminder that you're transforming us by the renewing of our minds that we could think as you do and feel toward people as you do, that we wouldn't just put up with them, but Lord, we would truly love them and do good to them, to show love to them, to look out for them when they're hurting and, and uh, make sure they have their basic necessities. Lord, you say we're to love one another as you've loved us. You tell us we're to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And Lord, you've provided everything that the world can't for us. And you've made everything else possible for us. So we just want to yield our lives afresh to you. And I pray for all my brothers and sisters that this would be a day of reckoning, of reconciliation, of rededication. That not one of us would just agree that these things are true without asking you, Lord, to work them in to the fabric of our lives, our thoughts, our words, our ways. And Lord, we pray that if there'd be even one here this hour, this day, who's never said, Jesus, come into my life, be my Lord, be my Savior, forgive my every sin, this would be that day. And if you need to give your life to the Lord Jesus, you are either dead in trespasses and sin or you are alive forever in him. And I want to see all of you in that alive forever in him category. So if you've never prayed to give your life to him, confessing you're a guilty sinner, that he's a, a holy God and that Jesus paid for your sins. He was, died for you. He was buried. He rose again. If you need to give your life to him, raise your hand and I'll acknowledge you. I'll pray for you and with you. And a miracle will take place within you. You will be born again. You will be forgiven all sin. Anyone this hour, anyone this service. If so, let's see that hand. Maybe in the overflow, maybe you're logged on or listening in. All you need to do is say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I'm guilty and I'm tired. I'm weary, and, and I can't take it anymore. I, I need the life I see in others. I need the light I see in their eyes. I need the forgiveness they speak of. I need you, Jesus, and I give my life to you, and I ask your forgiveness for all my sin. In your precious name, Jesus, amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer or you know someone who has recently, we want to get a Bible to you. If you're logged on or listening in, you should hear an announcement or see something going across the screen that just says, here's how you can get to us so we can get someone to you and make sure you get a Bible. But let's stand for one last song together.